Hey, 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 it's Rebecca, and you are listening to Resilient by Design. Today is part two in our Know Your Numbers series with my very own operations manager, Marilee Wright. If you guys caught episode number 96, that's when we really dived into the idea of project profitability, how to calculate if one of your projects is profitable. Hello, because we're running a business, not a hobby. And so today's episode is an extension of the first one. So I do recommend you go back and listen to episode 96 if you haven't already. There's a great freebie with that episode to help you follow along with some accounting and bookkeeping terms. It's kind of like finance 101 for running your own creative business. And part two is today, we dive into expenses, everything to do with expenses, what a run rate is, what are the expenses that you can use in your business? Like what are the items that you can um, attribute as a business expense? What does a write-off mean? And how do you determine your run rate? These are really powerful exercises. It may not sound sexy. I know. I get it. Numbers are not my passion either. But this episode can change your life. It has the power to change your life if you sit down and do the exercise that we express in detail for you to do to truly understand what it costs to run your business because this will lay the foundation for your planning ahead. Okay, enjoy part two of Know Your Numbers with Marilee Wright. All right. (laughs) I'm Rebecca Hay, and I've built a successful interior design business by trial and error, podcasts, online courses, and so many freaking books. Over the last decade, I've grown from an insecure student to having false starts to careers, and now I'm finally in the place where I want to be. Throughout my journey, it's been pretty obvious that I'm passionate about business and helping other entrepreneurs do the same. Each week, I'll share tangible takeaways from my own experience and the experiences of other badass women to help you build your confidence and change your business. There is literally nothing better than staying in my abode all day PJs, all day. These beauty, buttery, soft pajamas come in three fabulous colors, and trust me, you will never want to take them off. Check them out at lovemyabode.com and type in Resilient10 to get $10 off your very first order. Welcome back, Marilee. Welcome back to the podcast. Thank you, Rebecca. It's great to see you on this beautiful day. It is a beautiful day in Toronto. It feels like finally some nice weather. Finally. And uh, we're having you back because we're going to continue this however many part series, three part, part, I don't know, on knowing your numbers. Yes. And we had you, uh, the episode number, I will find out and I will share it here. In part one, we talked about project profitability. That's right, right? That's exactly right. We did. And understanding what revenue is, what makes up revenue, and how, which is your design fees and your profit on goods. And we talked about cost of goods sold and all that fun stuff. Awesome. So who are you for those who did not hear the previous episode? Do you want to give everyone just a little introduction as to who you are and why you are here to talk about numbers? Sure, I'd be happy to. So um, I'm a former chief operating officer. Um, and a former bank executive. And I've had lots of experience in business and really have a passion for coaching uh, small business owners. And I've been, you were my designer about seven years ago, and we did some business coaching after that project. And then uh, last year, I started doing some consulting work with you in your operations area and did a lot of work with your um financial analysis and forecasting and all of that fun stuff and helping you know your numbers. Absolutely. I just looked up the other episode. It's number 96. So for anyone who hasn't listened to it, go back and listen to episode 96. Marilee talks about understanding project profitability. Because that's what you have helped me try and master in my own business. It's no secret here that numbers have never been my passion. And so I've tended to turn a blind eye if you will, um, for many years, actually, not as long as I could pay myself 
and didn't run out of money. I felt like I was doing really well. But it turns out when you run a business, you need to know so much more than that if you truly want to grow and be profitable. And so I, I think today's episode is going to be really, really good for designers specifically because we're talking about expenses. Yeah. And knowing those numbers, because, you know, we recently had, you came into our designers room, our community, and for one of our months, and we talked about this, and I remember one of the designers said, huh, never really thought about it. I don't know what it costs to run my business every month. And And I said, don't worry, you're not alone. That was me for so long. And that's so many designers. If you're listening right now, and you're not in your head, like, yeah, no, I don't really know. And maybe, you know, at tax time, that's when I used to always know I'd have all my receipts in a box and I'd give it to the accountant. And then I'd be like, oh, turns out that's how much it cost me last year to run my business. Oh, and that's how much I made. Like, if you ask me how much money I made in 2017, I would tell you, I don't know. I think the accountant figured it out. <laughs> yeah, it's not uncommon in small businesses because you've got a lot on your plate. And so a lot of business owners, <laughs> You know, as long as there's cash in the bank and they can pay the bills and pay themselves, they're, you know, just running to keep up every day, right? So not spending a lot of time sort of truly understanding them. And I mean, listen, if you're not trying to grow your business and that works for you, it's not the end of the world. But if you want to really understand your business and and figure out how to grow it and do more of it, then it's important to know your numbers. Because the numbers don't lie. Absolutely. And that's been something that has been very eye-opening for me, as you know, but for those listening, is like to look at, oh, <clears throat> so this is what it really costs every month. Holy heck, I guess I need to make sure I'm charging enough. Because yeah. I never really knew. And I always thought, oh, that that project, I feel like we charged enough, but I didn't really know. I wasn't really tracking how much I collected against our hours. I wasn't really tracking the margins. I wasn't really tracking anything. And so once I started to really pay attention, and we're going to talk about this in this episode uh, and the run rate, which we'll get into in a minute, but once I started, and it's been relatively recently that I've really gotten a grasp of it, uh, it really changes your perspective. And mm-hmm. I've, I have found for me, I've started to look at my business more as a business, very much so as very much in, this is how much people cost. This is how much the overhead is. This is how much my expenses are. This is the value of the projects I have. This is the money that I anticipate coming in. Okay, that means I need to bring in this much more money if I want to keep the people, keep the costs. Yep. Or do I want to scale back? Do I want to grow? And so that's been really, really helpful to see it really from a numbers perspective, which is something that I never really thought I wanted to see, to be quite honest. Uh, and it can be scary. Right. Listen, it's it can be very scary. And and for entrepreneurs I've worked with who are creatives, as soon as you start talking numbers and finance and things like forecasting and all that kind of fun stuff, and it's kind of like Charlie Brown's teacher starts talking to them, you know, because it's not there. (laughs) It it (laughs) doesn't excite them, right? It's like you know, whatever, whatever. Math wasn't my my class and in, in school and whatever, I, I can pay my bills and I'm good. Um, but, you know, if you ever have that, you know, feeling like oh, on the, on your shoulder going, mm, but am I really profitable? Am I really making money? Uh, the only way really to know is to roll up your sleeves and understand what your expenses are and what it costs to run your business. Yeah. You I want to say, You might get some really happy surprises and you might get some like, oh, I really should pay more attention to that. As an example, you know, you if you don't do every so often a little deep dive, you may find you're still paying for something that you're not using anymore. Some subscription as an example, you know, and it could be maybe it's ten dollars a month, but maybe it's one hundred dollars a month. And and if you don't take a good hard look at things every so often. You know, why burn money when you don't need to? Absolutely. Yeah, it's like just turning a blind eye doesn't mean it's not there. Like if you pretend that it's not there, it doesn't mean it's not there. Yeah. Yeah. What is it? Really... Ignoring it doesn't make it go away. Yes, exactly. It's like hope is not a strategy. Same concept. <laughs> I was going to say that's my other favorite line. Hope is not a strategy. Yeah. I hope I'll get busier or I hope I have enough to like 
make rent next month. Like that's not, that's not a strategy. <laughs> you need to know exactly what you need and where you're going to find it. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. I totally, um, I love, I love that comparison to Charlie Brown's teacher. I would never have thought of that, but hearing you say it, cause like she just stands or he is a she, right. She stands at the top front of the class and it's just like talking, but it's like, well, you, you, you never, you never actually see the teacher. It's just, and they make it into sound and it's wah, 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 right wah, like garbly goop. Wah, yeah. wah, wah, wah. And so wah, wah. that's all it is, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> totally. And the irony of it is like you actually need, you think going into a creative industry, you're not going to need math. But you always, need math. you always need math, especially even in design, you need math because you need to be able to like figure out fractions and distances and use a tape measure. I remember like I still struggle with some of that stuff. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Okay, so let's dive into expenses because that's what today's episode is about because we've already talked about understanding some project profitability. And again, go back and listen to episode 96 if you want to know more about that. And so the next step is really understanding your expenses. So do you want to talk to us, Marilee, about what are expenses and what do they look like? I know there's different types of expenses. Walk us through that. Yeah, okay. So, oh, sorry about my cat. Come here, buddy. Okay, the listeners can't see, but um, Marilee has a beautiful orange tabby that keeps walking across her desk in front of the camera. (laughs) So your expenses. So expenses are cash outflows that you need to spend to run your business that are not specifically related to any one project. So if I back up just briefly for a second, when you have a project with a client, you know, your sales that you make of your of the items that you purchase for your client, the cost of those items are not considered expenses. Those are the cost of the goods that you're selling to your client. And the costs of those are minus from the how much you sell those goods to your client. And the difference is the profit you make on your goods. And that forms part of your profit. Um, And that's what we talked about in episode 96. That's right. And that's why we talked about, you know, don't give your discounts away and all of that kind of stuff, because you need to make profit on your goods, as well as, of course, the fees you're charging. So you got your got your profit. And then from that, that's your gross profit. You and I talked about that last time, right? The gross. um, And then from that, you're going to minus all of your expenses. So what are expenses? As I mentioned, they are the things that are non-project related that you have to spend money on every month or every other month or twice a year, however often it is, to continue to have your business operate. So it will be things like any marketing related expenses. That could be ads that you're placing. It could be you know, if, if you have a Facebook or an Instagram or a TikTok talk, if you pay for any ads there or you have any subscriptions for that, um, anything you do related to marketing, uh, advertising and promotion, possibly any market research you do. You know, I mean, sometimes if you're going to go and, and go to like the IDS as an example, right? I mean, the expense for that is a type of marketing research because you're going to an industry event to understand what's happening, right? And and how you compare and how you can put yourself out there from a marketing perspective. Project Uh, photography is one of the biggest expenses that designers would uh, put into this category. Would it not be here for marketing? Yes. And so, I mean, I don't want to complicate things so much, but again, how you can... It depends on what you're going to do with your projects, your photography. If you're just going to keep the photos for your own reference, then I wouldn't really call that marketing. But if you're going to take the photos so that you can A, have it as a reference for your projects and B, possibly use the photos in any of your ads or your brochures or your website or anything that's public facing from a marketing perspective. Social you, media, social Instagram, media. Facebook. Yep. Yep, then that would project photography, if if used that way, would definitely fall under marketing as well. Um, You know, if you have things like your car, so a lot of people, I mean, in your business, in the design business, most people need a car. So, you know, it could be you're the least expense on your car if you lease your car. 
If you buy your car, I, 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 it's not going to overcomplicate it. Your accountant would deal with your um, capital cost allowance on your car and how that gets written off on your, on your tax return. Let's not worry about that right now. Um, but, but from a cash flow perspective, and again, I'm not trying to overcomplicate things, I would put in the amount of what your car payments are, whether it's a lease or whether it's a car payment. Okay, because that's cash outflow. Um, as well as have- anything related to the car, right? So any um, service, gas. Exactly. So parking, you know, that you that you have to go to for whatever reason you're using your car to go for, you know, shopping or whatever, sourcing or whatever it is, your insurance expense, um, any service, your fuel, maintenance, all of that kind of stuff. Um, <clears throat> then... I would also consider any other travel expenses in that sort of relative category. Like let's say you had to take a cab or you had to take an Uber or you were on the 407 if you're in Toronto or any toll highways. Um, You know, those are all related to car, auto and travel. You also want to look at the nasty little things that the bank, the banks like to do to us, which is all our bank charges, right? And I only call them nasty because they only make billions of dollars every year. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> I did used to work at a bank, so I can say this. You know, I always say to people, if you don't like your bank charges, just buy bank stock. Because then you're going to pay yourself back a little bit because they rarely lose money. Um, anyway, so if you have, uh, you know, any service charges on for your bank accounts, I mean, it doesn't might not seem like if you're paying $20 a month, it might not seem like much, but on a, on a year, that's $240, right? And every dollar counts. Uh, credit card charges, if you have a fee for your credit card, which most credit cards have a fee, um, you know, if you incur any merchant account expenses. So as an example, if you use a service to process your credit card payments for your clients, they'll charge you merchant fees. I mean, you have to decide if you're going to pass those merchant fees on to your client as opposed to absorb them. And that's something that you would want to look at because they can be two, three, four, five percent depending on the card you're use, that the people use. Uh, as an example, if people use American Express cards to pay your bills, their merchant fees are much higher than Visa and MasterCard. And if you don't charge them back to the client, then that just comes money out of your pocket. Um, if there's any interest expenses, so if you have any loans for your business or anything like that, or um, you use your credit cards and you don't pay them off every month, you know, where you're carrying charges for uh, purchases you've made for clients, if there's interest on your credit card, that would get done there as well. Um, so there's lots of bank charges that you might not think about. Then think about all your computers. You know, do you lease your computers? If so, you got some monthly expense. Um, any uh, service as a software. So think about like design docs as an example of service as a software. Uh, Zoom, if you have a paid subscription, anything you have a paid subscription before that is a software. That That's why it's called SAAS, software as a service. They provide it. And if you're paying a monthly fee, you've got to capture that there. And this is one, I just want to interject for a second. This is one that's really started to creep up for most of us designers because historically we really didn't, most of us didn't use a lot of software, maybe AutoPad and usually like our Gmail or whatever email service provider you use, oftentimes those are free. And so it's something that I've really noticed. I mean, obviously I see it because of the coaching business, we do use more software, but even in our design business, now we're using so many programs, Zoom, especially we never, ever used Zoom ever before the pandemic like it wasn't even a thought yeah and now we 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 paid subscription we're using it things like asana design docs could fall under that right your accounting program the quickbooks there's a lot more that you're probably paying for that sometimes you don't realize especially if it comes out monthly versus annually a hundred percent agree um you know design files um if you have storage for your you know, a Google storage for your files or iCloud storage or whatever kind of storage you have for your files. Um, Often it's a monthly subscription and, you know, organizations from a business model perspective from organizations that offer sub software as a service on, on a subscription basis, 
the number of the, the amount is so small every month and it makes it affordable to people, both from a cost and a cash flow perspective, but it also makes it easy for you to forget about it. And, you know, you could end up paying for something a lot longer than you're using it. So when it comes to those types of expenses, the one question you always want to ask yourself is, if I'm going to need this year in and year out, is it, do I get a cost break for paying it up front annually? And if I do, can I afford to pay it in the month I want to pay the full year? Right. It's a, and that's a cash flow question. I mean, so, you know, if as an example, something is the software is a hundred dollars a month, but they say, if you pay it up front, you will only charge you $750. Well, then instead of paying $1,200 a year, you pay $750, you save $450. But, you know, do you have the $1,200 or do you have the $750 to pay it up front? And are you planning to use it for the whole year? So those are just considerations that you have to ask, you, ask yourself. But those are expenses. Um, and then if you have an office uh, that's not in your home, uh, you may have things like lease expenses. You know, you've got to pay your landlord, you pay your rent. You may have, you know, cleaners that come in and do any cleaning. Um, but irrespective of, you may have, sorry, you may have utilities at that office if you have a separate location. But if you work from home, as a lot of, I think, designers do, don't forget you still have office expenses because you're going to have things like, office supplies, you know, paper, pens, markers, whatever the things are that you need that you touch and feel to make, you know, your business work. Um, you know, your telephone, right? Your cell phone is a good example. And if you have a landline, that's a good, that would be as well. Uh, postage, delivery, um, you know, any, any of those sorts of things, anything that takes you to run your office. Um, you then may also have other types of expenses. The big one is meals and entertainment. When I say the big one, that's, I mean, it depends on how much you, you know, entertain. And this is, again, I would record all of your meals and entertainment if you're not sure. And then your accountant can let you know how much of that they can actually claim on your tax return. The key, though, if you're going to claim your meals and entertainment is on your receipts, you need to note who you were with for it in order for it to be a business expense, the date and who you were with and the purpose. The all, And I'm going to back up a second here with your car, because if you're going to claim your car as a business expense, you need to keep track of your mileage. And any person who has ever had an audit from the C, the, 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 CRA in Canada or the IRS in the US, I don't know what they're like in the US, but I know in Canada, when you claim any part of your vehicle as an expense for business, they expect you to keep very detailed records. So at the start of the year, you need to know what your odometer reading is, and then you need to be able to log you know, what your odometer, re odometer reading was when you started out on any day, whatever business thing you were doing, and how many kilometers you went. And so it does, it sounds like it can be complicated. It doesn't have to be complicated. If you try to make a note that you're doing it and, and keep a log on your phone or in your car or whatever, it's and a can lot. Can I just add there? I want to add because that happened to me. I was audited. I was audited only, it wasn't a company audit. It was, I was audited for my car expenses, specifically the mileage because I had told my accountant to um, factor in a really high percentage of my kilometers for business. And I said, 90%. And my, my accountant did her job and said, you're going to be flagged. Yeah. That's really high. And I was very defensive. And I said, I use it that much, but here's the thing. I hadn't actually been tracking my kilometers that well. I had some, but not really. I didn't really know, like I had the odometer reading. So when they came to me, I had to, and it was painful. And I, maybe I can find a way to share the spreadsheet that I use that, that was, that worked for me with the CRA that I went through my Google calendar yep. and I tracked an entire year. And it took weeks for me to do this. Cause like, I also was busy running my business. Yep. I tracked an entire year of kilometers with each event, the 
to from the office to the destination, from the destination to the office. And I supplied all of that to the CRA and they said, thank you very much. The, you know, the audit is closed. So okay. it worked. So what I did worked, but it was a painful experience and a great reminder of if you are going to claim those kilometers, you need to have a record because it's quite likely that at some point in time, the government will want to see your proof. Yeah, a hundred percent. And it is much more painful to go back and try to recreate it, especially if it's years ago, than it is to take a few minutes every time you pop in your car. Now, as an example, I know we're diverting, but this is a good conversation. If you use QuickBooks, QuickBooks has a feature because I know I used it once before that you can, it will track, like it has a GPS function, I believe. And so it'll track your, your mind, like what you're doing with your car. And you can always, you just go in and say it was work and you say what it was for or it's personal. Mm, and then cool. it, you just get the report at the end of the year. So just find an easy way to track it. Track. I find that it's easier tracking it in your calendar based on your appointments and then yeah. off you go. Yeah. Anyway, that was a bit of a segue. So sorry about that. That's okay. So we were just kind of walking through just so people understand when we say expenses, these are the things that we're referring to. And these are the things that you need to um, track. Yeah. We'll talk about that. And then you have um, payroll. So if you have any staff um, that are not directly paid only for their time working on projects. So as an example, as a designer, well, sorry, let me pause there. I would say at this point, because we did project profitability based on design fees charged and gross mar- gross profit on goods. So whether you have directly project-related expenses from a designer for freelance, let's say, we haven't done the getting to the net profit on a project. We haven't talked about that. So let's, so, so I know I'm sorry, I'm just thinking out loud. So what I would say is any payroll expenses and payroll can be staff that are on salary or they can be people who are on contract. They can be designers who are on on freelance. They can be people maybe you're paying AutoCAD, you know, for et cetera. Anytime you're paying for human persons, humans to do work for you, that's your payroll expense for that. And then you'll have things like professional fees. So maybe you pay a fee to um, uh, the, the uh, is it Rito? Is there a, I forget what it's called. Um, it's some fine. people remember a Rito, DDA, right. Build Association. There's a lot of associations that people could be paying dues to. That's right. So any dues you pay for that, uh, any lawyer's fees you might have to pay for your business, any accounting fees you might have to pay for your business. Uh, you know, maybe you're doing um, continuing education for your business, that kind of stuff. Um, so I think that's, you know, and then, of course, you have to things like we didn't talk about in software as a service. You might have things like, you know, website, your website hosting charges, as an example. Um, and finally, if you pay for storage for any of your projects. So if you purchase goods and you store them, you um, if they're related to the project, then they're going to come out as a project expense. But if you store anything else for yourself that, you know, I know in your business, Rebecca, you have something stored because maybe it didn't work on a project and you're kind of keeping it to work on a future project. So that becomes a storage expense. So uh, anyway, so that's that's not, I mean, listen, there. People, also, that could be inventory. Yes. Right. So some designers I know keep it in inventory or they have online, they sell. So that could be the inventory um, that you're storing or the cost of it. And there's, that's a whole yeah. thing, but yeah, that basically that summarizes all the expenses. We that's may have missed some, yeah. but that more or less. Yeah. There's, I mean, those are the main ones, right. You know, so, and then what I would do is I would, I would look at them and I would group them into categories, right. Because, you know, you want to what you want to do over time, if you do this, is compare periods over time to see whether or not a certain category, both those expenses are staying the same, going up or going down. So as an example, you know, if you have um, office expenses and you know typically in 12 months what they cost, and let's say you're actively trying to reduce your office expenses, if you keep the same items in the category, 
then you can compare one year to the next to see if you've been successful at reducing that or not. Yeah. And I just want to add, if you haven't been tracking this, it's okay. I get it. Um, it's something that you can do retroactively. You could sit down tomorrow and go through and look at your bank statements. And like a really basic way of doing this, if you haven't been entering it into a system like Design Docs or QuickBooks, or you don't have a bookkeeper who's done that for you, just get some different colored highlighters, print out all of your, and this is my old school way of doing things, but literally print out all of your bank statements and visa statements of all the accounts you have and go through and get your green highlighter and say, okay, I'm going to, my phone bill. Boom. I'm going to highlight my phone every month, go through the year, then take the purple highlighter and say, okay, where were all my parking charges, right? Like go category by category. That is easier than sometimes saving receipts. I mean, yes, keep all your receipts, but if you've never done anything like this before, the first place that I would recommend, and Marilyn, I'm curious what you think, but would be to start with just literally printing out all those statements yeah. and going through, and then obviously get us an Excel spreadsheet or a tally yeah. on a piece of paper and start to see, and then maybe are there patterns month over month, right? Yeah. Because some, some expenses are fixed and they happen repeating every month, or they could happen once a year but they probably all happen at a different time in the year. Yeah. For example, we just got a huge charge from Asana because we've upgraded to the professional. And I was like, whoa, I didn't see that coming, right? Because we get charged once a year. So when you can anticipate when those big ones come, those are those fixed expenses that you can anticipate. Then yeah. there's also things that are outside of that that are once in a blue moon, like going to ID at the interior design show, maybe going to high point market. Those are things or a meal. Those are more variable. And so you, you it's hard to predict, but maybe you can start to get a sense over yeah, time. That's right. And, and you're absolutely right, Rebecca. I think it's the easiest way to do it and to not over, overwhelm a person. If I was to print off a year's worth of bank statements and a year's worth of credit card statements and get my highlighter out, highlighter out I would have my Excel spreadsheet open and I would put the category in the rows down the left and I would put the months of the year across the top going from January to December and I would do one at a time and just yeah. and enter it right each month and then you use Excel to sum it all up and then it's it's organized for you. Yeah. And if you have like teenage kids and you can enlist them with a yeah. highlighter and say highlight everything that says I don't know, Roger's telephone, uh, get yeah. some help. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. So what do we do? Like once people are aware of the expenses and they see, okay, last year I spent X number of dollars on expenses. Yeah. So what? Okay. So the thing is when, what, what's, I would suggest is it's helpful to see them, not just by their categories, but also by month across the year. So you have the categories on the left, as I said, and the actual expenses, and then the months across the year. And, and then that way you can total up every month at the bottom of each column, and you can total up across each category. So based on, so you, you'll get two things out of that. You'll get to see monthly what it's, what your expenses are. And you'll, as you said, you'll be able to see whether or not there are variations in that. So, you know, you might, and, and over time you might see patterns, but then you can also see annually or yearly what you're spending on specific items. And when we do that, what you'll find when you, when you get your yearly total by any category or overall, people you'll hear sometimes refer to that as your expense run rate. So as an example, if you've added everything up for all of the categories and you've, and you've got all your categories totaled up across all of the months to get your annual cost and you total all your annual costs down and let's, I'm going to make it easy. Let's say your total expenses are $120,000 a year. And you just divide that by 12. This is quick. This is very quick and easy way to look at it. You just divide that number by 12, 12 months in the year. And you know that you spend on average 12 to $10,000 a month in expenses. And that's important to know that what your run rate is, because 
regardless of what's happening in your business, that much money has to be paid out from your business every month. Can I ask a question? On average, wait, because we're averaging at this point. This is averages, but at least it gives you a good thumbnail in terms of understanding what's going to happen. So yes, go ahead. Does this run rate, meaning your expenses per month, does this include paying yourself? Only if you add a line expense item for paying yourself. Do you recommend that designers include themselves in their run rate? Yes. Absolutely. I ask that because I think most designers think of themselves after the fact. Right. And I think it's really important that designers are paying themselves because it's a business, not a hobby. And for the longest time, I did not pay myself nearly enough. Yeah. Um, And so you need to factor yourself into that month. Yeah, 100%. So when you're doing your payroll, that's whenever you're paying money to a person for work, uh, whether it's on salary or contract or freelance, one of the people on that list should be you. And And regardless of how you pay yourself, right? Regardless of whether do you transfer money, do you write yourself a check? Are you on payroll? You need to include yourself. And I recommend that designers figure out how much they want to pay themselves monthly and stick to it. Because what happened with me is I would just pull out money as I needed it. Uh, And so some months I wouldn't take anything. And then other months I'd take out a large lump sum. And so it was very inconsistent. It's hard to anticipate. And those are called shareholder loans or dividends for those who are aware. And I know a lot of designers who pay themselves that way. Yeah. And then what happened at the end of the year, my accountant would say, oh, Rebecca, you paid yourself this month. I was like, or sorry, you paid yourself this much this past year. I was like, absolutely not. There's no way I paid myself that. I had no concept because I would just draw as needed. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's important to understand and factor yourself in because you don't want any surprises at the end of the year, number one. And number two, if you're going to then go from this point where we've done project profitability, we've now done business expenses. If you want to, as we continue on the series, you want to figure out how to put it all together to understand, you know, how to grow your business. You need to factor in paying yourself so that you know what, how much money you need to, what your expenses are every month that you absolutely have to cover to run your business. And that includes paying you. Yeah. And that's something we're not going to get into in this episode because it's a lot, but understanding, you know, how much are you charging? Like, is your hourly enough? Right. Um, and and to just to sort of back up to what you were saying, Marilee, about <clears throat> anticipating what you're paying yourself. And this is a separate conversation, but I just want to bring it up here is if you are not on a payroll within your company, which most designers are not that I know, you will have to then pay tax at the end of the year out of your pocket. And what happens is. And if you're not one of these people, then pat yourself on the back. Good for you for saving to pay personal taxes. But you will draw money every month, like $1,000 here, $500 there, $5,000, and you spend it. And then come tax time, your accountant says you owe several thousand dollars in personal income tax, even after all the write-offs and all whatever you can do with all the discounted things that accountants can do, you still will owe money. And what happened to me, and it happens to lots of people, is I was like, oh, shoot. Well, I only have what I need to live in my bank account right now. I guess I need to draw that from the business. So I would draw from next, I would draw money from the business, which would then, I would fall behind. And I'm not going to get into the details of it, but just if you know how much you're going to pay yourself, you can anticipate what the tax based on a percentage and your accountant can help you with that so that you're not in that situation. I remember one year my accountant was like, okay, you owe, I don't know, it was like $10,000 or more in income tax. And I was like, I don't have that in my bank account. Yeah. And so yeah. she's like, okay, well, you'll have to take it from the business. And then that's going to be considered income for the next calendar year. Yeah. It becomes... Yeah. So like, it just becomes a, a, a snowball if you keep doing it that way. And I mean, you know, if you don't put yourself on a payroll, but you do draw from the business, the simplest thing to do 
is talk to your accountant about what your average tax rate is and whatever money, like say you take $1,000 out, if you have a 30% tax rate, have a separate bank account and you just put $300 in it and that's your tax account, mm-hmm. right? I mean, you can, you can you know, sort of quote unquote tax yourself by saving it up and then at the end of the year, you'll have it. And if you don't need all of it, then it's a little bit of a windfall at that point, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Anyhow, I digress there, but I just wanted to no, it's important. point that out because paying yourself is a big part of running your business. Yeah, absolutely. So that's so so you're when you understand your annual expenses, and you can, I mean, you can just take the total, divide it by twelve months of the year, and that's on average what your monthly uh, expenses are. You can then look and see, like, are some months are going to be higher, some months are going to be lower, and over, and you'll maybe want to look at why, and then that may be a pattern that evolves over the years. Um, the one thing I want to say, <laughs> Rebecca, you and I've talked about this before. Do you want to talk about write-offs? Because you mentioned that. <laughs> yeah, I think write-offs, because I, I think there's a good opportunity for clarification. If anyone here watches Ships Creek, the Canadian television series, it's a comedy. Um, there was a really great episode with David and he started his own business and he kept buying all these things. And his dad was like, what is all this? He's like, oh, don't worry, dad. It's a write-off. And it's a really funny episode. Look it up. But essentially, he assumed that meant that all the things he bought for his business were free and that the government would reimburse him. Yeah. That's not what a write-off is, is it, Marilee? No, that is not what a write-off is. <laughs> <laughs> Can you help uh, maybe break that down for those of us who always kind of thought like, oh, well, I can... I don't know, buy this course, or I can fly to High Point, or I can take my clients out for dinner. It's a write-off. And and so it's it's a yeah, it's, so it's a term. And and what it really means is you can write that ex- business expense. It has to be a business expense related to the business. You can write it off as an expense in the business that will reduce your income. But it, it's still all it is is a what all it is is a is an expense that you can show is a business expense versus a personal expense. So if it's a business expense, you, it becomes a business expense line item in your expenses, like we were just talking about, and all of those expenses will be deducted from your income to determine what your net income will be. And then you will be taxed on your net income. It's important to, uh, so it's not free because you have to still pay for it. The cash still has to come from you. Uh, So all it really, it's just the benefit is as here's an example. If you need to buy a new computer, as opposed to paying for it personally, you buy it in the business and it becomes a line item expense, a computer expense, and it reduces your income. Now, again, anybody who knows anything about taxes, they're going to say, well, that's a capital purchase and my accountant might want to write like reduce, do depreciation. Don't just, this is just an example, right? So yep. if you want, if you're doing like, if you're taking a trip to High Point, You know, instead of paying for that personally, you're going to, you can pay for it out of the business. Although if you're sole proprietor, it's all the same pot of money. Um, But you can write it as an expense against your business. So it shows as a line item as an expense and it will reduce your income. Yeah. Yeah. And like in simple terms, if you take your client for dinner and you pay for it out of the business, Yes. On a business card, yes. then that will help you in the long run. I'm not going to get into detail, but if you pay for it on your personal card and you just say, oh, it was a client, and that's not a good example. It, no, it doesn't matter because it doesn't matter how you pay for it. You just have to have the receipt and account for it. The point is. Then you and, should reimburse yourself from your business. That's right. If you do it on your personal. Yes. Yes. Right. So the point is, the bottom line is write-offs aren't free. It's not free money from the government. Yeah, just because you can use it for your business doesn't mean you should purchase it. Make sure you're making smart choices about the money you spend because you still are paying for it out of your bank. That's right. Exactly. So to summarize, there's a lot of expense talk. 
your run rate is really important because it helps you understand what it costs to keep your doors open, if you will, right? Every you stay month, in business. Every month, regardless of what income is coming in, this is what it takes for you to keep your doors open every month. On average, yeah. once you calculate it, divide it by 12, that's your average monthly expenses. That's your run rate. Yes. And when you're starting your business, that will be very low because it's likely just you working from home with some softwares, maybe a car. But as you start to grow and bring on someone on contract, hire a freelancer, engage in an, with an employee, hire an admin, maybe you hire a bookkeeper. As your, as your company grows and the projects you work on grow in size and volume, then you will need more people to service those clients. And as you grow, and this is what I have learned, is you really need to get a handle on what it costs. Because sometimes, you know, you might think, oh, I really need another designer because I've got another project coming, we can't handle it. But does having that other designer on board actually make your expenses too much money? And even though you have a great new project, it may not be enough to cover everyone. And so I think, especially as you start to grow, if you can start now while your company is smaller, while you only have one or two people, get a really clear handle on it, it's going to help you. And this is something I wish I had. It, it could have really would have helped me with my scaling instead of me guessing. Like I was, it was guesswork all the time. I feel busy. So I feel like I should hire. Oh my gosh, we've got that big model home coming up. Oh my gosh, I definitely need at least two interns. I think I might need another designer. And then at the end of the year, wondering why our company didn't really make much of a profit, even though that project itself brought in a really strong profit. Right. That's right. And Rebecca, that's such a good point because the projects, any given project's gross, gross profit will look fabulous. But what you have to do, and this is, I know where we're going to go in the next episode, is understanding what your annual expenses are and, and what your monthly run rate is, is critical to understanding how many projects of what size, at what profitability, at what frequency you need to bring in to have that covered and make a profit and figure out, you know, do you want to keep growing the business? Because once you understand that, you may say, mm, if my business is that size and I need to have that many projects at that profitability with that many people, you might say, that's not really what I want to do. So you might make yeah. a different decision, but until you have, until you really understand it, um, you know, and, and the easiest thing to do once you know your annual expenses is it's, it's, well, like I say, it's pretty simple for anybody with a bit of a math brain. It's pretty simple to just work backwards and say, so that means you need to make this much money in gross profit. Yeah. And, and I can tell you, you know, for those of you who are listening and you're like, oh, how do I know if I want to grow, if I want to get small, like you don't necessarily know until you get there and yeah. that's okay. Right. And you might, and you might start out thinking you want the big studio with like 30 plus employees. But as you start to grow, and I know firsthand designers who've gone through this where they've started to grow their business and they realized, wow, at this size, I'm not doing as much design work anymore. I am overseeing and managing people. And I really have to manage sales because if I don't get another $400,000 job, I can't afford these people. And so you end up becoming the salesperson and the manager and you're not designing. And I know somebody, two people recently in Toronto who were like, I don't like managing people or I really have never enjoyed sales. Okay. Another option. You could hire someone, but now you're getting bigger. You could hire someone to manage people. You could hire someone to do the sales. And now, yes, you're a big fancy CEO, but you got a large payroll and you better make sure everyone is running on full steam ahead. And so yeah. I know people who have said, you know what? I want to keep it small and just do the projects I want to work on with one or two people helping me freelance. Yep. And that's okay too. And that's why in so many of my programs, we teach the, the value in knowing what it is that you want. And yes. Marilyn and I, you and I had this conversation a lot lately, but it's just sort of the idea that, if you're not excited about your business and what you do, it's not going to be successful, especially as a creative entrepreneur. 
Yeah. You are the heart and soul of your business. And so if you start to lose interest because it's starting to scale or go a certain direction that you really didn't foresee, or maybe you just change who you are um, and you want to move to Costa Rica, whatever it is, you need to listen to you and not worry about what everybody else around you is doing. And part of it is really understanding your numbers and understanding your expenses because not everybody that you're looking to and you admire is necessarily financially robust. Yes. We make assumptions that we see that designer on Instagram. Look at all those people. She may not know her numbers. Yep. You don't know. Yeah. Everyone's looking, you know, everyone might be looking to you thinking, wow, look, you've got it all figured out. Meanwhile, behind the scenes, you're like, I need another podcast. Send me all the spreadsheets. <laughs> right. So you really do need to, to know your numbers, know what it costs and decide when you're comfortable growing to that next step. It's a great point, Rebecca, because when you understand it, you can then look and say, what is it going to take to maintain and, and continue to grow? And then you, you, so you'll know what kind of projects do I need at what size? And, and am I prepared to put in the effort and the marketing dollars, which has the expenses, but you know, blah, blah, blah. I mean, just, is that, am I doing the right things to get that business coming in? And is that what I want to be doing with my time? And if you do, then that's fantastic. And if you don't, and you then you have, you have to add in, as you said, the people you need to hire to do the parts of the business you don't want to do, but that just increases your annual expenses, which means that will just increase the amount of projects that you have to bring in to co- offset that. Yeah. So, you know, none of, neither is bad or good. It's what you want to do. The other thing I would just say on that is as you're considering, you know, whether or not you want to grow your business, scaling is one of the most difficult things I will say that small business owners do or attempt to do. Um, If you do not know your numbers well enough and you don't plan it out, your own success can become your worst enemy if you're not careful. It can get away from you, especially if you don't know your numbers. So, you know, if you're like getting really busy and you're adding people and you're adding this and you're adding that, and then, you know, all of a sudden you go, well, now I've got to do this and maybe the market changes or, you know, I mean, there's lots going on in the market right now. Um, You know, if you haven't been really keeping your eye on the ball, uh, it can, it, it can become a bit of a tipping point. Um, and then also sometimes you've got to put in the, there's that, that's the, the sort of the pain period, right? Where you're, you're ramping up for growth. Things might may or may not change. You realize you might have to do something a little bit differently. There may be some pain for that period of time. And you just have to decide if you can see yourself getting over that period of pain. It's investing in growth and, and investing in growth can be scary. Um, and it it doesn't it's not always smooth sailing. No, I, I think it's rarely smooth sailing. <laughs> That's a polite way of nice way of putting it. <laughs> I mean, there's all, there's so much to continually be learning. And that's why I wanted to break these episodes down uh, into bite-sized pieces, because I know that sometimes this information can feel overwhelming. And um, Marilee, I thank you for, for, for really breaking it down for us, because I agree with you. It's, you do have to know your numbers and, and especially if you do want to scale. And I can be honest, like for the longest time, I thought I wanted to scale, scale, scale. That was my goal. I always loved business. But I've had to sort of reevaluate at what point do I want to stop scaling and and maintain my business sizes. I have other I have other interests, as you all know. I want time to do my podcast. I want time to do the coaching programs, to do power process, to be available to my community. And so that does limit the time I can put into my design business. And so I, I'm I'm making choices right now behind the scenes about how what does my business look like? You know, it's interesting. I was dropping my kids off at school today, and another parent is a real estate agent, and he's reevaluating his business model, and he's looking at rebranding and bringing on his wife and making it more of a family thing. And do they do they want other brokers? Like they're reevaluating how they're doing things, and I think it's okay to change direction and course correct. As you change your mind, ultimately, that's why you're in your own business in the first place, right? 
Otherwise you could go work for somebody else. That's right. And, and making those decisions, it's imperative that you know your numbers. Yes. Otherwise you're making decisions in the dark and hoping, which is not a strategy, right. hoping it'll work out for the best, but really not knowing. And so then it's actually scarier. Yes. Yes. And the first time, you know, it can feel overwhelming to do this. And, 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 you know, like as we ignorance in understanding the numbers that it takes to operate your business, ignorance is not bliss in that say in that situation. Right. And, and, you know, you might like the ahas, whether they go like, wait, whether you go, Oh my God, or it doesn't matter if the ahas are like, you know, sort of lay you out or make you happy. It's because once you know, then you can actually deal with it. Yeah. Yeah. That, uh, the unknown just sits as an albatross or a monkey on your back as a kind of like, you know, waiting and waiting and waiting to pound. You know, it's there, but yeah. sometimes you don't want to keep running that fast to stay in front of it. So 100%. You know, put on your big boy and big girl pants and get to know your numbers. Face, your the, face the music. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and actually, everybody, we are developing, um, we have a course uh, that is, at the time of this release, I'm not sure if it's available yet, but you can go to rebeccahay.com forward slash pricing. And I have created a course all about pricing your design services and understanding all of these things. We've pulled it all together in a nice, tidy little bow. It's a little course. It's available at any time. There's no special time to wait for it. It's on the website. So go to rebeccahay.com forward slash pricing. And if it's not there yet, it will be. Um, it'll, there'll be a, there'll be a, something there waiting for you, but definitely go and download that. Uh, I think it might help you to get, push you into the practical application of a lot of the things that we're talking about here with Marilee and I. Um, and all, honestly, if you guys have any questions at all, please put them in the Designer Meetup Facebook group. It's a really active place. It's a safe community that's private where design professionals are sharing and asking questions and being vulnerable. And it's really beautiful to see. It's a great community. So if you guys have follow-up questions for myself um, and Marilee, you can put them there. Um, and I would just love to hear what everyone thinks about this episode because uh, it's not a typical episode for us. We're talking about numbers, guys. We're talking about numbers. <laughs> Any last nugget of wisdom, Marilee, you'd like to leave our audience with? Um, last nugget of wisdom. I would just like to say that your numbers are your friends. <laughs> Maybe. Make your numbers your friends. Make friends with make friends with your numbers, and your numbers will make friends with you. That is a first. I've never heard anyone say that. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Oh my lord! All right. Well, thank you so much for being on the podcast again. We will have you back. What's next for our series? Do you think? Well, there's a couple of ways we could go. Um, and who knows, maybe people will comment on what they'd prefer to hear next. Um, I suppose there's, let me think about it. There's three things we could do um, forecasting. And because uh, once you know your project profitability and you know your expenses and your run rates, you can actually start to forecast out your year. So you actually know what you're going to need to run to, to have a successful year. Um, we could do, um, oh, I forget. What was I just about to say? We could do, we've done project profitability. We talked about like hiring too. And right. So yes, yeah, so we can understand when you can afford to hire. How do yeah. you know? Yeah. So we can, we can go in and take, take a look at, you know, sort of once you know this about your business, your run rate, we can then, I can help people understand how do you use that to understand what if scenarios, what if I want to hire an admin, what if I want to, what does it mean? What's it going to do to my expense run rate? And what will that mean for the amount of projects that I need to bring in? And how much do I need to charge? That's the, big That's the third thing I was going to say is once you know your run rate and you do some what if scenarios, as you and I have done, you can start to work that backwards to figure out what should you actually be looking to charge hourly. 
right? Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, so that's there's there's many ways we can go with this, but I'd say what can you so pricing and what can you charge based on knowing your numbers and and what your perspective plans are. Um, I forget what I have the worst forecasting. Forecasting. forecasting, sorry, forecasting and what if scenarios. Yeah. Yes. So there's lots to come. All that to say, there's lots to come. Uh, let us know if there's one of those that really sticks out. Um, but we're excited to help everybody and would love to hear your wins. If you've started this and we've because of this episode, if you've started putting together expenses and tracking and you've learned something or you've had an aha moment, please share with us. I would love to know that this episode is helping. If you think there's someone who could benefit from hearing this, please share this podcast and this episode with your friends. Um, we always love to help as many people as we can. And uh, that's it. Thanks for listening, Marilee. Thanks for being my guest today. You're very welcome. I hope you have a great rest of the day and a great weekend. And uh, everybody get out there and learn your numbers. Yahoo! Okay, guys, that was a lot of math talk. How you feeling? <laughs> I hope you're not feeling overwhelmed or discouraged. The point of these Know Your Numbers episodes or this three or four, I don't know how many part series that we're doing. I'll let you know when it's the last one, though. I do promise that. Um, actually, we'll probably always have episodes like this, but you know, this little series with Marilee is kind of special because Marilee has truly brought a lot to my attention. Numbers don't lie. Knowing them can be scary, but quite often you might be surprised by what you find and it could be positive. I know right now I've been going through a lot, a lot of digging and a lot of number crunching to really understand what size of projects I need to bring in to cover my expenses at any given size of team. Because the reality is the people who work inside my business are my biggest expense. And as you grow, you'll start to see that. And so understanding what does that mean? What type of projects do I need to bring into the business so that we can break even and then hopefully also be profitable? Anyhow, I hope you guys enjoy this episode. Um, that's it. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed this episode. I'll see you soon.